Do you have my screen? Yes, we have, we have. Okay, there we go. Can you see it in full screen? Lovely. Yes, we do. All right, thank you very much for your kind invitation for me to present here. And, um, and thank you also for letting me stretch um, our focus a little bit into the 16th century. Uh, I am more of a Renaissance person than I am a medievalist, but I won't try to uh, tilt the direction of this conference a little bit later, although I will be going a little later. In two recent articles, Charles Brewer and Jan Sigelbauer trace the various manifestations of the medieval chant, Auditellus Audimadi Maris Limbus, from a trope of the Libera Me to an independent song. The early versions show an obvious affinity to the apocalyptic Libera Me text when, with images of the day of wrath, when heaven will take flight and the land will waver like the waves of the sea. Around the turn of the 14th century, however, different versions of the song began to appear in which the primary theme is no longer the coming day of judgment, but sic transit gloria mundi. These versions also began to include variations of the literary ubi sunt topos. The main point is that everything earthly passes away even the great heroes and philosophers of classical antiquity and the Old Testament. These chants end with a prayer to God for mercy as he punishes the wicked. The Auditellus tradition did not end with the medieval era, however. To date, I have found printed versions of Auditellus in four 16th century cancionalen. The Catholic Johannes Holtusius's Compendium Cancionum Ecclesiasticarum of 1579, the Lutheran Matthäus Ludicus's Vesperale et Matutinale of 1589, the Lutheran Nicholas Selnecker's Christliche Psalmen Lieder und Kirchengesänge of 1587, and a publication printed in Nuremberg titled Responsoria Quae Annuati Min Veteri Ecclesia de Tempere Festis et Sanctis Cantari Solent of 1562. Three of the four versions of Auditellus, the Holtusius, Ludicus, and Nuremberg, are identical to each other, save for a few minor details at cadences. Selnecker's version is mostly identical to the others except for the addition of two different phrases at the end, which I will explain later. These versions of Auditellus appear to be in three sections. In section one, what I call the Sic Transit Gloria Mundi section, the poet states that everything under the sun is temporal and transitory. Royal dignity, profundity, and wealth are worth nothing and physical substances are as transitory as ice that melts in the sun's rays. The second section is the Ubi Plato literary topos. The poet asks, where are the great men of classical antiquity, including Plato, Cicero, Virgil, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, and Hector? The poet then asks, where are the great men of the Old Testament, including David, Solomon, and Absalom? The answer is that they fell into the depths like stones and that no one knows whether or not they have been granted rest. The third section, beginning with said to Deus, is a prayer for God's mercy as he punishes the wicked. The musical structure of the 16th century Auditellus chants is rather curious. There are only five melodic phrases, which I have labeled A through E. The first phrase, A, only appears at the beginning, and the fifth phrase, E, only appears at the end. In between are repetitions of B, C, and D phrases. The B phrase is varied twice in the Ubi Plato section. C and D remain unchanged throughout. 
This arrangement has similarities to the traditional form of the sequence in which a series of paired versicles are bookended by single lines. Perhaps this is why Holtusius placed his Auditellus chant in a section titled Sequencia de Corpore Christi. As mentioned before, the Holtusius, Ludicus, and Nuremberg versions are practical, I, pr practically identical to each other. The music is in printed hoofnagel notation in which most of the notes are single black rhomboids and some are black rhomboids with stems. There are a few duplex notes linked together, primarily in places in which two pitches occur on the same syllable. In contrast to these, the Selnecker version is printed in semibrevs with longs on the last syllable of each phrase. It is intriguing that a meter sign, a half circle with a vertical slash through it, is placed at the beginning of the chant, although there is no indication that the music is rhythmicized in any way. Selnecker's version is intriguing for another reason as well. It is titled Vetus et Vulgaris Cantus de Morte Correctus, or Former and Common Song of Death Corrected. This chant is corrected in two ways. First, it ends on the modal final of A, whereas the other three end on the pitch B, the step above the final. Second, it is corrected theologically. The Holtusius, Ludicus, and Nuremberg versions end with the phrase, sed tu Deus rector fidelium, facte nobis semper propitium, cum de malis fiet judicium. But thou God, ruler of the faithful, be always kind to us as you pass judgment on the wicked. But Selnecker makes sure that the proper Lutheran theology is present at the end of his version. Damnati sunt infideles, salvantur soli credentes, ergo tu Deus recto fidelium, facte proper Christum nobis semper propitium, cum de malis fiat judicium. Infidels are damned, only believers are saved. Therefore thou, God, ruler of the faithful, for the sake of Christ, be always kind to us, as you pass judgment on the wicked. And musically, the new sections are properly labeled as B, C, B, F, and E1. As I previously mentioned, with the exception of Selnecker's corrections, the melodies of the four Auditellus chants are practically identical. Therefore, it is logical to assume that they have a common source. Of course, it would take quite a while to find and examine every manuscript that contains Auditello's settings. However, thanks to Charles Brewer, I believe that I have found at least a close relative. In his article, Plato, Aristotle, Paris, and Helen at the Last Judgment, The Legacy of Auditello's Aurimani Maris Limbus, Dr. Brewer mentions a 14th century manuscript a Psalterium Ferriatum from Mainz that contains a Central European variant melody of the Auditellus chant. This melody, with three exceptions, is identical to the four printed versions that I have been discussing. In addition, 17 out of the 29 lines of text are the same as or similar to the printed versions. Later in his article, Dr. Brewer observed that the rubrics for some of the various Auditellus chants indicate that they were sung as part of the procession for the office of the dead. One early 16th century version indicates that it was sung on All Souls Day. Dr. Brewer also notes that in some of the later sources, the versicle has lost its association with the libera me and is rubricated in a new way, cantus seu sequentia. Auditellus's label as a sequence and its association with the dead continued in the 16th century. 
in the three printed Lutheran publications, the chant is labeled as a cantus with the title Logares Cantus de Morte, or Common Song of Death. In the Nuremberg Responsoria, Auditellus is placed at the end of a section of miscellaneous chants that includes prosas, the Te Deum Laudamus, and Salve Jesu Christe Rex Misericordiae, a Christological Contrafactum of the Salve Regina. Seldnecker placed Auditellus in a section titled Tröstliche Lieder aus dem Catechismo, or Comforting Songs from the Catechism. Other songs in the section include Allein zu dir, Herr Jesu Christ, Steh mir, Herr Jesu Christe bei, and the setting of Psalm 90. Ludicus placed Auditellus in a large section titled Responsoria et Antiphonae Quedam Generalis Apueris Qui Corende Quam Vocant Intersunt Alternatim Canende. General responsories and antiphons for boys in the Corinda who sing alternating songs when present. The Corinda was a group of poor students who sang at weddings and funerals to earn money which would help support them in school. Auditellus is in a section titled In Exequies for funerals. It is preceded by the popular funeral antiphon Media Vita in Morte Sumus, In the midst of life we are in death. Another clue as to the function of the Auditellus chant is found in the secondary literature. In his Anthologie Christische Gesänge aus allen Jahrhunderten der Kirche of 1817, August Jakob Rambach stated that Auditellus is found in collections from the 16th century as an old and customary song and was sung in many towns, also in the churches at the vigils for the dead. In searching for a context in which to place the 16th century Auditellus chants, I turned to contemporaneous books on the art of dying from a Lutheran perspective. Several of them have passages that echo the theme of Auditellus. The closest match that I have found to date is Adam Walliser's Kunst wohl zu sterben, The Art of Dying Well, first printed in Dilligen in 1569. Beginning on page 15 is a long passage titled Der Kirchen Trauer Gesang Auditellus. This passage is a German paraphrase of the Auditellus text, including an opening Sit Transit Gloria Mundi section and the Ubi Sunt Topos. It begins with the German version of the Latin, listen to the earth, listen to the great sea, listen to everything that lives under the sun. The ornament and sincerity of this world is transitory and fleeting as all these temporal things attest. Everything that is goes away as ice melts when the sun shines. The next section is the traditional Ubisunt Topos that includes both writers and philosophers of classical antiquity and figures from the Old Testament. Wallacer's version departs from the Auditellus tradition at the end, however. Rather than a prayer to God for mercy, it closes with an admonition to see, learn, and contemplate the lessons of the passage. Another version of the Ubi Sunt Topos is included in Johannes Spangenberg's Ein Neu of 1544. In it, Spangenberg makes the point that all who are born must die by quoting the Ubi Sunt Topos, listing Paris, Helen, Plato, Cicero, Virgil, Aristotle, Samson, Solomon, and Absalom, among others. He concludes with a summa, Sie müssen alle in todes pein, so viel ihr in der Welt geboren sein. In conclusion, how are we to view these 16th century versions of Auditellus? I believe that a major clue is provided by their placement in the Lutheran Kanzionalen. As I mentioned earlier, 
in Selnecker's Cancional, it is placed in a section titled Comforting Songs from the Catechism. In the Nuremberg Responsoria, Auditalus is immediately preceded by Psalm 90, a prayer for God's mercy at death, and the hymn, Salve Jesu Christe Rex Misericordiae. And in Ludicus's Vesperale, Auritellus is in a group of chants intended to be sung by a choir at funerals, including Luther's favorite hymn, Media Vita in Morte Sumus. The common thread in all of these songs is trost, comfort or consolation, a theme far removed from the apocalyptic and judgmental images of the medieval Auritellus texts. In Reforming the Art of Dying, the Ars Moriendi in the German Reformation, author Ostrobrinus described how Martin Luther and the other authors sought to create a reformed Ars Moriendi, or Art of Dying. According to Luther, the consolation offered by the medieval church's teaching on death made the dying person more despondent than hopeful. Instead, he emphasized the certainty of salvation through faith as the source of real consolation. In a similar vein, Auditellus' transformation from judgment to comfort paralleled the reformation of the Ars Moriendi from fear and despondency to consolation and hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan for this uh, paper. There are comments uh, or uh, questions? I need to get back. Maybe it was interesting to see the musical text. I'm sorry? the the music of this uh, Auditellus Audimani Maris Limbus okay but there are many many sources with uh, with a uh, notation uh, uh yes i have um i have found four uh cancionalen with uh, this kind of, do you still have my screen? Can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. There are still um, the the four. The I'm sorry. The three that I found have this printed notation. The Selnecker is nothing but semibrevs with um, uh, longs at the end of each phrase, and that's it. The other sources that I've seen. Um, I tried to um, extract them and put them in a slide, but uh, I could not apparently for proprietary reasons. Um, but the uh, everything that I've uh, that I've seen is in um, what I, as a I'm a non-expert in the history of notation, but it looks like Central European Hofnagel notation. Yes. With uh, stems and rhomboids. In the chat, there is a, a question by Jan. What are differences between 16th century version and the supposed model? Is there textual proximity or a melodical one? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Well, you just, um, if I may, you just identified one uh, one manuscript from Mainz as a supposed model for the 16th century versions. Yes. And I would be interested, uh, what is the, uh, where those versions are close or where, where they are, con, what to say, what is the, oh, um, if, if they are similar to each other in, what is the parameter I, I, in which they are similar? Yes, and I have it. Uh, there are actually only three. Um, let's see. The uh, let me see if I can go back to this. The uh, 
The only differences are the first half of B1, the first half of B2, and the second half of E are the only differences. Uh, the A, uh, the, the normal Bs, the Cs, and all the Ds are identical. Okay. And so only they are melodically, three short melodically. places are different. I'm sorry? Only melodically. They are different. They are, have different melodies. Or uh, there are those three phrasal differences. There are um, some um, textual differences. Um, there are uh, 27 lines in total and uh, 19 of the, uh, the 15th century version are either identical or contain the same thought, maybe with words rearranged. Okay. So um, I would love to find what I could prove to be a direct ancestor to these, but uh, since Dr. Brewer identified the Mainz um, uh, uh, manuscript as uh, Central European, an early uh, Central European variant of the Audi tell us I, I would push it, put it, uh, I would characterize it more as um, maybe an uncle or maybe a cousin. Okay. Uh, I found it strikingly uh, similar to the 16th century ones, but I can't draw a direct line. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the manuscript is now in Mainz, but it is of Central European origin, and I do not know anything more specific than that, unfortunately. Okay. So you don't know if it's 14th century or 15th century? According to Charles Brewer, it's 14th century. Okay. Thank you. There is another question by Barbara. If uh, Auditalus is sung, uh, is sung by Lutheran congregations then, and it's in their hymnals, Lutheran Gesang Booker. This melody is now in use. Alan. I'm, I'm sorry, I, d I don't understand the question. If you read the, um, the chat. Let's see are. if I can go. If I can get my screen back. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, if I can get my uh, uh, share. Just go with the mouse um, and um, here, why don't, why don't I ask the question um, right. since, since it's mine. My question is simply, and you may have already said this, was Audi Tellus sung by a congregation, by all of the Lutherans uh, in the church together, or was it sung by soloists, or, and, and does it appear in Lutheran Gesangbücher or hymnals? Um, I have found it, um, as I mentioned, I have, I have found it only in four Kansianalen. Um, okay, well, the Kansianalen is, yeah. I've, and I've, I have looked in um, dozens of congregational books, and I have okay. not seen it. Okay, um, that's, that's interesting. Uh, it's, I get the feeling from looking at these um, it's my impression that um, I know, for example, the Ludicus was written um, to keep alive the tradition of Gregorian chant in the Lutheran services. Um, so I think they, uh, the, the four that I found are really directed toward singers in the church rather than congregations. I, I okay. do not believe it was a congregational song because, um, largely because of the length and the complexity. Okay, uh, that makes a lot of sense. It may have been used for, a pri say, a private devotion. The text could have been used as private devotion, but I really kind of doubt it was congregational. Thank you again to Alan. 
and uh, the last speaker is uh, Lang. Has to sh uh, stop sharing his screen. Alan, do you know how to do that? Yes. You I'll have to go uh, on the top of your screen and okay. yeah. Stop share. Thank you. <laughs> okay, got it. All right, thank you.